Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Um, this is sort of a follow-on video to the last video I did. Um, we're going to take a look at GNU Radio Companion. And um, in the first video that I did, and I'm going to put a link to it up above here, we take a, took a look at this remote and decoding it. And um, I did most of the introduction to GNU Radio and stuff like that in the first video. So again, please refer to that. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at this other remote I have. And um, this, is, this remote's a lot simpler than the last remote was in some ways. In other ways, it's a little more complicated. But we're going to walk through what I did to decode this remote. Uh, same as the previous video, I want to apologize for any sound or video quality issues. I figured getting a video done for you guys would be uh, more beneficial than worrying about the video and audio quality. So to hopefully at least meet some kind of minimum standard. Um, but uh, again, I apologize. So again, uh, we find that our journey begins with uh, SDR Sharp. Um, and again, not a comprehensive lesson into SDR Sharp, but let's go ahead and start the acquisition. And we've got our remote here, and every time I push the button, you see a signal pop up. Let me try to do it from... Because we're getting some extra noise because I'm real close to the antenna. You can see that right here is about the mid frequency of the signal we're looking at. And um, as compared to the last um, signal that we looked at, um, this one only has one peak that kind of pops up instead of the two peaks. And so this is a different kind of modulation. Whereas the first remote I looked at with the two peaks was um, frequency shift keying where the, high, uh, the higher frequency um, was the highs and lower frequency was the lows and you would switch between the two back and forth to get your highs and your lows. In this case there's only one peak and that peak kind of comes and goes and that is called either uh, on-off keying or uh, amplitude shift keying where the presence of the signal is a high and the absence of a signal is a low. And basically what they're doing is just turning the carrier's signal on and off. And here is what the signal processing chain looks like for this new remote. It's a lot simpler than the old remote, because, well, a lot simpler than the first remote we looked at, um, because this is on-off keying. And on off keying, uh, we're only effectively looking for the magnitude. The frequency doesn't matter to us. And so, well, it doesn't matter per se. And so after we receive the signal, which we saw is at 314.912 megahertz, we then just process it from a complex signal to a magnitude. And that's really it. I mean, that's how you get your high and low peaks. And so after we process it, we run it through a filter. Um, this is, a again, a low-pass filter. And this time I noted what my parameters were, that my sample, uh, samples per second was uh, 4.8 million. Um, my uh, start frequency was uh, 25 kilohertz, and my end frequency was 35 kilohertz. And I had to kind of play around with that a little bit, more so than the last one, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so then we have a rational resampler, which takes the 4.8 million samples a second and turns it into 2.4 million samples a second. As I mentioned with the uh, last remote that I probably don't need this, but it's nice not to have uh, too many samples. Um, then we take it through a threshold, and so what we're looking for is to just kind of square up um, the signal, and the threshold here has a separation between the low and the high, and so that gives us a little bit of hysteresis in case the signal's still just a little bit um, fuzzy. 
uh, after the uh, filter over here. And after that, we feed the signal into our time sink to see what the signal looks like, and we feed our signal into the uh, decoder section. Um, now let's fire it up and see what the signal actually looks like. We're going to wait for a new radio to launch. There we go. And then whenever I hit the button, you see signals appear. And these are our pulses. These are our transmissions. If we go ahead and zoom into that guy, we can see that we have this big spike over here. And most likely this is meant to excite the receiver to go, hey, there's a transmission coming. After this big spike, we have a bunch of consecutive little spikes. And this is our preamble. That um, This is meant to synchronize uh, the receiver with the message. And then after the, so after the uh, preamble, we have the message itself. Um, as the last remote we looked at, uh, the message appears to be Manchester coded meaning that the uh, signal is encoded in the edges, and uh, meaning that if it's a rising edge, it's one bit, and if it's a falling edge, it's another bit. And um, uh, this is compared to highs and lows. And so, so this is what the um, signal looks like, and this is the signal uh, we're going to be analyzing. And so now let's uh, jump into the code and have a look-see what uh, is going on under the hood as we um, look at this message. Now, I do want to mention strategy. What is my strategy for analyzing this data? As with the last um, key fob that we looked at, the strategy was we had two inputs. One input uh, was the magnitude, and that's what we used for triggering effectively and uh, once we uh, triggered again so to speak um, we would then look for the message in the second signal uh, here we only have the magnitude and so we don't have something convenient to trigger off of because you never know are you somewhere here in the message are you here in the message are you here in the message etc it, it's not uh, super duper clear just from outright looking at the data and so the strategy is to look for a large blank space, uh, then capture any of the data that comes through, and then stop capturing when you hit another large blank space. And here we have the code. Um, the code is uh, nearly entirely recycled from uh, the uh, first project and then basically modified as necessary to fulfill the needs that we have. So uh, the few changes here at the beginning are um, we only have a single 32-bit uh, floating point uh, input because, as I already said, we only have a single data stream to work with, and that is the magnitude. Um, the other thing I added was dead space as an input, and that basically allows me to control how much um, empty space before or after the message um, that I'm looking for to adjust for where the message is. Um, continuing to look through the code, uh, again I'm using a state machine and uh, the uh, state machine starts in state one. And so whenever we're in state one, uh, we are validating that we have a bunch of dead space. The way this works is we take every message and we uh, check to see if any of it is above the zero mark, which in this case, since we're, it's a zero to one, and so I'm using the half uh, mark to trigger off of, so to speak. So if any of the messages above half, meaning we have ones, and we reset the size to zero. Um, Whenever um, the message is full of uh, just empty space, no ones, no edges, or anything of the sorts, we uh, accumulate the size. 
as we accumulate the size, eventually we get to a point when the size exceeds the uh, dead space. And let me jump over to here. My dead space is set to 5,000. So you have to get 5,000 data points in a row before um, it's considered that you're in the chunk of dead space. And start recording. Let me jump back over to the code. Once we find the dead space, we switch over to state two. Uh, state two um, starts looking for edges. And basically we're looking for the leading edge. We're looking for something to uh, trigger off of. Now that we've had the dead space, now that we've had the dead space, the next area after that, we're looking for just the very first edge. And as soon as we find it, we know we've hit the message. And so here we keep checking to see if we find a leading edge. If we do find a leading edge, um, then we go ahead and start storing data and convert to state three. <clears throat> uh, state three now uh, accumulates all of the data and stops recording whenever another area of dead space has gone through. So it accumulates, 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 and every time it sees edges, it resets the size back to zero. As soon as it stops seeing edges, it starts to accumulate the size up until the size reaches the dead space, you know, the 5,000 points that we had set. And we jump over to state four, which is our analysis. In the analysis in um, state four, uh, first we check to make sure that the message is large enough. And in this case, uh, we want the message to be greater than 30,000 samples. And this was basically just intrinsically found that any message below 30,000 is garbage and we want to throw it away. Um, we go ahead and we find our edges by subtracting the, the, the same array from itself, kind of like that. We subtract it out. Um, and then we find our edge differences. From the edge differences, we grab um, an average point, which is uh, somewhere in the preamble. Um, from there, we make sure that there are enough edges here. Um, we go ahead and we uh, trim down uh, the edges here, and we look for um, the start uh, edge position. So all of this is basically the same, that we are looking for uh, the beginning edge of the preamble because there could be some noise um, in that start area where we see, let me show it to you. <clears throat> do, 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 as it launches, let me look at a message. So we are looking at this area right here that we have the preamble here. And so we're looking to find where this edge is by making sure that we throw these edges away. And the confusing part can be at times that the area here is not always this clean. There's other stuff in here that the time sink for some reason does not show you. And I'm not sure why. <clears throat> so then we... Uh, uh, look for the starting edge. We make sure that everything is consecutive. And once everything is happy, then so we go ahead and generate the comparison for consecutiveness. And once that co comparison checks out, we drop into here where we uh, find what the period is, which involves averaging together uh, a chunk of the preamble. We generate the start location. Um, sorry, there are some extra comments in here that I want to get rid of while I'm looking at it. Uh, in this case, uh, the start edge is not offset by one. The previous remote was. On this remote, the start edge begins right at the uh, leading edge of the preamble. And uh, then we generate our... Uh, positive ticks and negative ticks and the idea being that if you have an edge the positive tick samples just before the edge the negative tick samples on the other side 
and by taking these two samples we can then compare them to make sure that the edge is you know either leading or uh, not leading uh, that it's a rising edge or a falling edge and we can do that by XORing it uh, all together later on now here is where we get the fun bit if you want to call it that and what I ran into is that let me pull a message up again what I ran into is that uh, this fob has a tendency to drift and I'm actually not sure if it's jitter or drift but let me pull up a message and let me zoom in on it so what we've done so far zoom in a little more what we've done so far is we found this edge here and then we started sampling so we take a sample on this side sample on this side Sample on this side, sample on this side, sample on this side, sample on this side. But the problem is, let me zoom out again, when I start getting into, let's say, the message here, the, the samples are one period apart. So you would take a sample here, take a sample here, take a sample here, take a sample here. But then the uh, sampling would slowly start to drift out of alignment. So we'd get up to here and we would take a sample here and a sample just on the other side. And then we'd get here and we'd take a sample here and then the next sample would be right here. And we go to the next edge and we take a sample here and a sample here and they would come out of alignment. And um, this was difficult to deal with. And so I wrote a small algorithm to be able to um, realign my sampling with my edges. The way I do that is first I generate an array of all of the edges of interest and I call that optimized edges. So if I grab the location of the first edge so edge location zero and store it that's the edge location that we found for the beginning of the preamble then what i do is whenever i have an edge that uh, is um, well plus or minus 20 percent from the other one i go ahead and store it and so if i have two edges that are far apart so let me um, show it here so if i have this edge and this edge they are within plus minus 20 percent of the period and i go ahead and store this edge then i go ahead and take this edge and compare it to this edge which uh, theoretically this edge should be at 50 percent of the period and so it falls outside that plus minus 20 percent because it's going to be less than 80 percent and so this edge gets thrown away and then I grab this edge and compare it back to this edge and now we're within it and I go through and I do that with the entire message and I store it in my optimized edges array <clears throat> then I do a pass on the array uh, which uh, compares and makes sure that the positive tick um, is uh... oh I see yeah, yeah trying to read my code in the fly then I check if the positive tick is greater than the optimized edge it's supposed to uh, align with it means we're out of alignment and so what we do is we find uh, what the difference is between those uh, edges you know if our if we're so if this is our edge we're supposed to be here but instead we're over here we check to see what this difference is and then once we know the difference we add a little bit more to it to put it back over here and then we go through and we adjust both the negative and the positive array to slide all the edges over and then we do the same thing with negative edges edge that the negative if the negative edge is um, uh, greater than the message um, that means that the edge is on the wrong side and then we add to the edge to make sure that it slides 
over, I'm sorry, if the negative edge is less than, if the negative tick, the is less than the edge, the negative tick should be on the other side, should be greater than the edge, and so we readjust the edge accordingly. Now that we've adjusted um, where we want to sample, um, I go ahead and convert the uh, data to trues and falses. And then I reshape the data by using the positive ticks and the negative ticks uh, that we made, which uh, lets me uh, grab the bits. Uh, in this case, uh, empirically, I found that we have 88 bits, which uh, gives us a nice uh, 11 bytes of data. And uh, this was convenient as compared to the first remote where I had to uh, trim off part of the preamble to give us nice bite size uh, chunks. I believe I shaved off six uh, bits of the preamble, which the preamble is all the same. But uh, this gives us a truer uh, representation of the data. And then uh, just to make sure that we sampled correctly, we XOR. Uh, the two packets together so that with the XOR, if you have any two uh, samples that are not opposite of each other, so you have either a true or false, uh, I'm sorry, a true and a false, or a true and a false, and when you XOR them together, you get true. And we're making sure that all of the samples when XOR together comes back as true. And then uh, that gives us that the packet is valid. Um, or in this case, the way I put it was the XOR did not resolve if this fails. Once we know we have a valid packet, we go ahead and we uh, reshape the packet again into a three-dimensional array of um, 11 rows with eight columns, and then we convert the message uh, using this right here, and then we display the message. Uh, finally, after we've done all of this, we go ahead and reset all of our parameters uh, back to what we started from and uh, start this whole thing over again. And uh, we can go ahead and look at the code to see, I'm sorry, look at the messages to see what the messages look like. And so let me expand the sum so we can look at more messages. And so uh, things that I have found is uh, this section here depends on which button you're pressing. So if I press the, um, this is the lock button, the, the symbols are worn off, all, worn off a little bit. So this is lock. You get fours. So four, four, and the messages always come in groups of four on top of that. So anytime you press the button, even if you hold the button, when you hold the button, you always get four messages. And so if I hold the unlock button, it's a one. I don't know why it highlights like this. This is weird. If I hold the panic button, it is an eight. And if I hit the trunk release, it is a two. And so that's very predictable as how that works. Uh, the other thing I noticed is that um, these two bytes here, these two, um, seem to be a uh, number only used once, and they count up all the time. So let me hit the, um, this is the lock button, and so this is a six right here. It should become a seven, and then an eight, and then a nine, and then an A. B, C, D, E, and eventually it will become an F, and you will get an FF here, which is ready for a rollover, and this 9 over here will turn into an A. So FE, FF, and there we go, this becomes 0, 0. And this turns into AA. Uh, if you didn't already notice, all of the numbers here at the beginning always stays the same, which is probably the ID of the remote. And what that leaves us with is this column here and this column here. Uh, they are the same across each one of the four messages. So if we go like that, 
here we have 82, and here we have the F. And then we have 67 and D5. And most likely what these messages are that uh, if I had to guess, this is probably the checksum because it's at the end of the message. The checksum makes sense at the end of the message. And then uh, this one is the, excuse me, um, how would you put it? This one is the, uh, the encrypted bit, if you really want to call it that. But this is the, the validation that uh, both the number only used once and everything else aligns so the car will accept the message. Rolling code, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, this is most likely the rolling code. What I don't know, what I haven't tried, and maybe just for um, shits and giggles I will, uh, roll all the way through uh, what, these two lines. Is it those two? Oh, sorry, these two. Roll all the way through these two lines, hitting the same button, and see if the number you get is a leap. And that would definitely tell us if um, um, we're going through a large array of these numbers, or if this number is not a repeat, some sort of other mechanism is happening in the background. Uh, same with uh, the uh, code for the first remote. I am going to uh, post this up on my website and put a link to it down in the description below. Uh, it may take me a day or two after the release of the video to uh, get those posted, so uh, hold tight. Um, if you have any uh, questions or comments, you're welcome to put them in the uh, comments down below. Uh, don't forget to uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, that always helps, and uh, thank you for watching.